We all have dreams and though life happens and occasionally veers us off the path, dreamers must unwaveringly believe in their dreams. She said it best, no matter where you are from, your dreams are valid. As Kenyans, clearly, we are not without inspiration. No matter what corner of the country we look, we can find a dreamer who took on the world to reveal the Kenyan part of the dream. The American poet Henry Wadsworth once wrote, the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. This is the story of Africa's banking titan, James Mungi. Mwangi, at the age of 32, changed the mode of banking in Africa. How, you may ask? Mwangi simply went for the unbanked. He opened banking halls to dirty peasant farmers. Your oh, Highness, uh, Secretary of State, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pressure to be here uh, today. And I want to declare that from the onset, uh, I'm a champion of financial inclusion. If, if nothing else, I hope what I will achieve is to lead and persuade you, to lead and take this as uh, an agenda for all of us. Because when uh, you get uh, two billion people excluded from financial inclusion, it then means that uh, they are denied the opportunity uh, leader to realize their dreams. Financial systems allocate resources. So if you are not being allocated resources, then it means you are condemned to your status, which normally is poverty. And... But before we get deeper into how he did it, allow us to tell you a story. On June 9, 2012, James Mwangi walked into the Ernest & Young World Entrepreneur of the Year 2012 Awards Gala in Monte Carlo. This event is an Oscars for entrepreneurs. Wangi then was not an A-lister. He was a nobody. His banking peers were the notables, executives from Credit Suisse, HSBC, the Royal Bank of Scotland, JP Morgan Chase, Barclays Bank, Standard Chartered, they were all gathered in Monte Carlo. It would seem as though Mwangi simply did not belong there. What would a former milkman from Moranga be doing in Monte Carlo anyway? James Mwangi was there as CEO and Group MD of Equity Bank, a small bank that had begun with a capital outlay of just $100 with its humble roots from a small village of Ruadia in Moranga County. His competition in the award ceremony wasn't just in banking and finance, but in big pharmaceuticals, tech, aviation, fashion, agriculture, weapons manufacturing. The list was endless. At the gala table, he was bound together in an obscure corner with other African heads of industry. Then the unthinkable happened. James Mwangi was named the Ernest & Young World Entrepreneur of the Year in 2012. 2012 Ernst & Young World Entrepreneur of the Year is Dr. James Mwangi, Equity Bank Limited from Kenya. The room was stunned and silent. Meanwhile, at the African table, excited Nigerians and South Africans applauded and had Mwangi. It was the first time an African had won in the 25-year existence of the awards. It wasn't just a Kenyan milestone, it was an African one. In accepting the award, this is what he said. This award makes a point that Africa is ready to be fully integrated with the rest of the world and what we hold are perceptions that are very far from reality. This is global recognition for Africans who are embracing the power of entrepreneurship to change the economic and social state of our 
A pertinent question to ask is, what did Mwangi do to get noticed by the business world? And also, what was it that he did that was so monumental that his success transcended not just local, regional, or continental markets, but the global market? This is a story of James Mwangi. James Mwangi was born in Kangima constituency, Moranga County in 1962. Mwangi and his six siblings were raised by a single mother, Grace Wairimo, after their father, who was in the Mau Mau, was killed in the Abadeas while fighting for Kenya's independence struggle. The family grew up poor and tended livestock, made charcoal, sold milk and fruits, and other produce to survive. Grace Wairimo was a power behind Mwangi's success. She was tough on him. Mwangi, while describing his mother, once said, My mother ensured that we were disciplined, and she laid out a set of values which became anchors in our lives. And if there was one thing she never compromised on, it was education. She educated all her children despite the harsh economic times the family went through. Mwangi attended Nyagatogo Primary School in Kangema, then proceeded to Ishagaki Secondary School. Here, he was introduced for the first time to accounting and commerce. This was an important discovery, he recollects. I could see how the systems related to small businesses. We had been going about business in a haphazard way, but here was a systematic method of doing the same things with far better results. It was an eye-opener. At Ishagaki Secondary School, Mwangi obtained outstanding O-level results and went to Kagema High School to do his A-levels in economics, literature, and geography. After doing his A-levels, Mwangi joined the University of Nairobi, graduating with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. He went on to sit and pass the Certified Public Accountant of Kenya. SIPAC examinations. Mwangi first worked as an auditor at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC. After a short stint at PwC, he moved over to Ernest & Young, where he worked for three years before joining the now defunct Trade Bank. In 1991, he left his job as a group financial controller at Trade Bank after Peter Munga, the founder of Equity Bank, approached Mwangi to steer equity from insolvency. Equity was then known as Equity Building Society. Mwangi joined Equity as Finance and Operations Director, a position he held until 2004 when he became the CEO. When Mwangi joined Equity, the bank was technically insolvent and headed for closure. Deposits were a mere 22 million shillings, loans at about 9 million shillings, and losses at 33 million shillings, against a capital of 3 million shillings. Therefore, the bank was technically insolvent to the tune of about 30 million shillings. At the time, Equity had 27 employees, 27,000 customers, 5 branches, and stood at number 66 out of 66 in the financial sector rankings. They only had two products, one was savings and the other was a mortgage product. James and his team set out to build a customer base. Equity Bank started about 35 uh, years ago. After 10 years, it was declared uh, technically insolvent and was condemned uh, for closure. It was number 66 out of 66 financial institutions in Kenya and uh, it had distinguished itself by having accumulated the highest losses of that period. It had started with a capital base of one million Kenya shillings, but it had accumulated the losses. At the time, Kenya was going through an uncomfortable transition phase from the old colonial structures to the needs of the relatively new nation. The banks reeked of colonial practices were the biggest banks reported to London and had English bosses. For example, Barclays Bank and Standard Chartered, two of the largest banks back then, took direction from London. KCB employed English executives, 
All of these banks focused on the top and middle of the pyramid client bases. The client base had to fit a corporate look and one needed to have a minimum balance of 10,000 shillings or more. This meant that although there was huge demand for banking and credit services, the industry remained more or less an exclusive shop. The vast majority was simply shut out of the financial system. The international banks turned their noses up at the prospect of catering to the masses. James Mwangi was aware of this and he turned this disservice into a formidable strategy. Guy is solvent to 32. Okay. Um, the funny thing, the total assets were only 22 million. So how they balanced the books, I didn't know. Uh, so that's where the story starts. Uh, and essentially this was the era of microcredit. He went for the mass market. He went for the bottom of the pyramid. Farmers dressed in muddy gumboots and simple butter shoes were allowed into banking halls. Minimum balance requirements were expunged. Account opening procedures were simplified. Equity deployed agents to open client accounts right from the street. The model was revolutionary and the results phenomenal. The bank grew and deposits flowed. aspect was the recognition that uh, by that time only 4% of Kenyans had bank accounts and so banks were not in the marketplace, they were niche players. The market was 96% and then there were niche players at 4%. So equity chose not to compete with the, uh, with the banks but chose to compete uh, with uh, who was providing financial services to those who were excluded. Research reflected that people were keeping their money under the mattress. And so our competitor's analysis was not about banks or financial institutions, it was about the mattress. And suddenly, we realized why the mattress was more competitive than the banks. It was not charging fees. That was one of the things. It had no minimum balance. It was accepting whatever uh, a person had. Uh, the third one, uh, was that uh, it was availing liquidity while needed, but banks were restricting uh, withdrawal on two aspects, frequency and amount. If you wanted more than uh, a certain amount, you had to give seven days notice, and you could only access your money uh, once. Uh, so these are the tools that we did. So in our model of banking, we removed minimum balance. We said, you open an account even when you don't have anything. If you have an expectation or a dream of ever getting something, we'll give you an account. The second thing, you could withdraw the maximum you had, but we could also offer you, in case you came and you found your money had not come to the bank or had not been credited, we could allow you a little bit of credit to be able to travel back home. So minimum balance went to negative build on trust. The, second, the third thing, we removed the ledger fee because poor people could not understand how they keep their money in the bank and somebody keeps on withdrawing through ledger fee and studying orders as we all knew them. So we abolished all that and then we removed the frequency. We allowed people to withdraw as many times as they could and limitation of how much you could withdraw. So that was literally uh, changing the model of the bank. But more importantly was we changed uh, equity from a commercial mindset uh, to a social uh, movement mindset. And that was more on the corporate philosophy. And I'm a member. I'm a member. I'm a member. And I'm a member. By 2008, Equity Bank had a total of 2.8 million bank accounts, which comprised of 48% of all Kenya's bank accounts. This actually meant that for every two accounts held in Kenya, one belonged to Equity Bank. In the same year, Equity was ranked the number one bank in the banking survey by Think Business in Africa. The awards flowed in. The bank won the Euro Money Award for the best bank in Kenya in 2007 and 2008. At the Africa Investor Award Ceremony held at the New York Stock Exchange in September 2008, 
Equity Bank was named the best performing public listed company in Africa, and the awards have not stopped flowing. Most recently, Mwangi was a recipient of the prestigious 2020 Oslo Business for Peace Award, which is also described as a Nobel Prize for Business. Nominees are chosen by a prestigious award committee consisting of past Nobel Prize winners in peace and economics. It is the highest global distinction given to a business leader. It celebrates their efforts at promoting peace and prosperity for the greater good of society through their everyday business activities. Today, Equity Bank is the largest bank in Eastern Central Africa. It has assets worth 700 billion shillings, a customer base of 14.2 million customers, a yearly turnover of $2.3 billion, and has over 7,000 employees. It is present in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, South Sudan, and the DRC. The architect of all this is one man, James Mwangi. 36 years later, he has pulled equity from the lowest performing bank in Kenya to the largest bank in Eastern Central Africa. The Mwangi model is studied in several business schools, including the Stanford Graduate Business School, Columbia Business School, and Lagos Business School. Who knows, maybe one day, Mwangi's method of making money at the bottom of the pyramid will be referred to by business graduates as the Mwangi's theory, alongside Marxist and Keynesian theories. One thing is clear, when history is finally written, James Mwangi's story won't just be a Kenyan one. Mwangi will be at the center of Africa's economic renaissance, but most importantly, he will be at the center of the Kenyan part of the dream.